Well, we're in the, uh, what I'm calling the final four sermons. And I put them into brackets. And last week, the first one was next gen, or the reaching the next generation. So that means grace moves on to the finals on Easter Sunday. And today, oh, Nelly, we got quite the matchup uh, between mission and unity. Now, again, I'm taking this, my lead here, not from my own thoughts, but from the Apostle Paul and the words of Jesus. So, which one do you think it'll be today and which one will move on to the finals in Easter Sunday? Well, here's what you should do. Listen to the scripture passages today and see uh, what it is. So, based on the lessons you heard or the songs we're singing, which one are we talking about today? Unity. Unity. So that means mission moves on to the finals on Easter Sunday. But today we're talking about unity within the body of the Christ Church. Let me ask you a question. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being like uber important, how important is unity within a congregation? Very important. In fact, I think we can feel it more than even understand it. We can feel it when there's unity, and maybe even more so, we can feel it in our gut when there's disunity. We can feel that in our country right now, don't we? The angst about the disunity we have. Maybe you have a circle of friends where there's been disunity and it tears you apart. Maybe even in your family and how debilitating that is. You see, as we move from larger groups to smaller, more intimate groups, when there's disunity in those smaller groups, it's even more disruptive and, and the emotions are even more intense. And I would say a congregational family is like one of those smaller groups. We've had, in the years that I've been here, we've had times of disunity. Some of you remember some difficult days we had back in like 07 and 08 and 09. I remember there was a family that's came to start worshiping with us during that time. And they worshiped with us, and they were excited what was going on. They looked like they were going to join. And then all of a sudden, they stopped coming. I had no idea why. A few years later, they came back, and they eventually joined. And they were actually in one of my life groups with me. And I asked the, the husband and father, I said, what happened that you were the coming and you weren't? He says, I don't know. He says, when we were coming back in 07, 08, there was something I could just sense was wrong. He said it this way. When I was in the hallways at church, I could feel something wasn't right. That's the way it is with disunity. We feel it in our gut. What are the feelings or what's the experiences that we have when there's disunity among a group of people that matter to us? Well, we're sad. We might be scared as to what's going to happen. We may be mad. I think it, we tend towards being, feeling hopeless when there's disunity going on. It's like something you counted on is being removed. A, a pillar of your foundation is kicked out. And you feel empty when there's disunity within a congregation. And it can consume your thoughts and words. When we were going through times of disunity, and Katie and I would be out for one of our walks, we'd say, like, this is all we talk about. It starts to consume your conversations, this, the disunity. It cripples mission. When that family came back a few years later, and I said, well, what's the difference? He says, well, I just, it feels different now. Whatever it was, and he didn't, he didn't even know what had happened. He could just feel it. But when there's disunity, it starts to cripple our mission. And I want to tell you, it is not, it is not what the Lord intends for us. The Apostle Paul had some priorities in his life. 
and in his mission. And in fact, as I read his letters, these are four of the, these may be the four top priorities, hence the bracket. And I'm putting them in the importance that I think they were to Paul, although mission and unity were right there together. And I've wondered, where did Paul get this understanding? He was the one that came up with this amazing image that we are all one body in Christ, like a human body. We're all parts. We're so connected, so unified with one another. It's like we're part of the same body. And this week as I've been thinking about it, where did Paul get that? Well, one thing we know about Paul, at least as far as we can tell, he never met Jesus when Jesus walked the earth. He met Jesus after Jesus had risen from the dead and Jesus appeared to him on that Damascus road. But when Jesus is actually before his crucifixion, we have no record of Paul meeting Jesus. I've had this imagination this week. I would imagine, I've imagined that after Paul became a follower of Jesus, and when he would meet with the apostles, maybe especially the apostle John, because maybe he could sense that John had been especially close to Jesus. That one day, Paul took John aside and he said, hey, you know, I never got to meet him. What was he like? Tell me about him. What was important to him? And maybe John said this. Well, I want to tell you, Paul, the last night we were together at the Passover meal, he taught us a lot of things, and then he prayed. And you know what he prayed for? He prayed for unity among us and among those who had come to believe because of us, which is the whole Christian church. He prayed that we would be so united, that we'd be so one, it would be like the relationship between God the Father and God the Son. That close. In fact, Paul, he said that our mission depends on this. That when we are united, then the world will know who Jesus is. That's how important it is. This is mission critical. And I wonder if that's why Paul, because if you get a little glimpse of the early life of Paul, he didn't seem to matter if he caused disunity. In fact, that seemed to be part of his goal. But he had this change. And maybe he got that from John. In the, Apostle Paul, in the teaching of the Apostle Paul, unity takes precedence over every, almost everything else. So when Paul addresses issues like leadership in the church, or church discipline, or stewardship, or what you pay your preachers, or spiritual gifts, or the structure of the church, all very important things. He says, they, unity takes precedent over those. And there was one very divisive issue that Paul addressed. In fact, he did it in two of his diff letters. You know what it was? Food. How important is food? And the issue was this. There was food, particularly meat, that had been offered to pagan idols. And you could go get this fine meat. It was cost less. And you could buy it. How would you feel about that? You go over to Kroger's after church today. And, you know, in the meat counter, there's some, you know, beef that's, Regular beef and then beef that's been offered to pagan idols. But it's cheaper. Would you buy that? Would you bargain shop that one? Yeah, hey, I'll take that. Paul said, it's fine because those pagan idols are nothing. They mean nothing. And you are free to have that meat. You're free in Christ. But it was causing disunity in the church, because some were saying, wow, that's wrong to eat meat that's been offered to pagan idols. So this is what Paul taught. 
Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. How would it make a difference if we live by this? That be careful that the exercise of your rights, I mean, we hear so much about rights today. What would it be like if the exercise of our rights we held back on, that they would not become a stumbling block to others, especially in the body of Christ? Paul also addressed this divisive issue in his letter to the Romans. Let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. Don't tear apart the work of God over. Uh, Here, it's what you eat. But we could fill in anything here. You know, we have a lot of differences in our church here, in our body of Christ. We have differences over... Politics, if I would mention a couple politicians' names, we would immediately be divisive. We have differences over economics. We have differences over human sexuality and gender identity and gender roles, over climate change, over the Second Amendment, over Black Lives Matter, over leadership in the church and worship styles and baptism. And more. You could fill that, don't tear apart the work of God over, and you could fill in that blank with whatever is the differences that we have. He goes on to say, you may believe that there's nothing wrong with what you're doing, but isn't this great? Keep it between you and God. Boy, if we would live that way, you know, keep it off of Facebook. Keep it between you and God. When a congregation is divided over what I'm going to call, and and please hang with me for just a moment. I don't don't want you to hear this in any way judgmental. Over non-essential things. When a congregation is divided over non-essential things, Lives are adversely effective and mission is crippled. We heard the teaching from the Apostle Paul today on unity. This is what he said. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, in other words, saying, if you at all are like Jesus in any way, if you have any relationship or connection with Jesus, Then, Paul says, next slide, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one in spirit and one in mind. Well, that's the problem, isn't it? We're not like-minded, are we? We don't have the same mind on any range of issues. And these issues matter to us. So one thing, dear ones, hear me on this. We don't dismiss those issues. We don't devalue them because, while maybe it's not so important to me, it's really important to someone else. They matter. All those things I listed, we have divisions within this room, within those of us who are joining us online over all those things. In the history of the church, baptism has been a very divisive issue. We've gone to war over baptism. One of the black marks in Lutheran history is that we put to death Amish and Mennonite people because they would not baptize their children. These things matter. They're very important to us. But this is how we should navigate our differences. And this is what I want you to remember from today. Stay united through affirming our essential beliefs and mission. Well, where do we find our essential beliefs? In the creeds. The creeds that we have are taking the whole Bible and squeezing it down to a few paragraphs. 
That's our sense of beliefs. If something is not addressed in the creed, while it's important, it is not essential. And it should not divide us. Where do we find our essential mission? In the words of Jesus. Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. His great commission. We don't have to look for that. That's our essential mission. Now, we've taken that, and we've put it into this one phrase. Connect people into a growing relationship with Jesus. That is our mission statement. It says connect people. It doesn't say divide people over non-essential beliefs or practices. In our day, it is a primary goal of the evil one to divide congregations. It is a primary goal of the evil one to blow congregations up. Because when that happens, the mission is crippled. Here was St. Luke Lutheran Church, 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006, 2007, 2008, 2000. That's exactly what happened in terms of attendance, in terms of participation. Being divided, disunity in a congregation cripples this mission. And frankly, according to Jesus, it hurts our ability to even believe. He said, when you are united, then people will know, Father, that you sent me. St. Luke has many differences in our families, in our family. And these differences matter to us. At the same time, we should not allow these differences to divide us or motivate us to walk away from this family. We stay united through affirming our essential beliefs and mission. One of the books that has been really helpful to me in understanding human relationships is a book called Crucial Conversations. I mean, I've mentioned it before. So let me apply that thinking to here. When you have a difference that matters, so you have a difference of opinion, it could be over politics, it could be over baptism, it could be over any number of things. And it matters, the stakes are high and we are emotionally involved. When you have that kind of difference, if you're going to seek unity and seek to be in conversation, continue to be in conversation with one another, here's what you have to think. Before you start to deal with that divisive issue, first affirm what you, more, you, what you hold in common on a more deeper level. Say, we may disagree about this, but we're all together on this one. And that's our essential beliefs and mission. When you affirm that first, then you can more productively deal with those differences that you have. I have found it to be a help, this, this what I'm going to put up here now, to be a helpful understanding that I think reflects the prayer of Jesus and the teaching of Paul. In our essential beliefs, we have mission, beliefs and mission, we have unity. We have to. Pastor Mike can't get up here and say, Jesus Christ rose from the dead, and then I get up here the next way and say, we can say, no, he didn't. You can't be divided on essential beliefs that are in our creed or what our essential mission is. You have to have unity in that. But here's what the next one is. In our non-essential beliefs and practices, and please understand, when I say non-essential, I'm not saying they're not important. Hear me on this. Just saying they're not in the creeds. They're not essential. In our non-essential beliefs, we have liberty. We, we say to one another, we're going to differ on this, but we're going to give each other the freedom to that. We have differences in our congregation over baptism, but whether you should baptize babies or not. Just like it's been in the church for centuries. 
I mean, baptism is pretty important. But we have liberty in that. And then the third one is this. In all our beliefs, mission, and practices, we show charity. Even when we have differences over essential things, we still show charity. We still show love. We don't become judgmental. We don't shun. We don't cast away. We don't look with dispersion on someone because they believe or practice something different than us. We show charity in all things. Again, the Apostle Paul leads the way in this. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interests of others. Let me put this in a phrase that I've begun to use in the last number of years since I learned it a few years ago that I find helpful. It goes like this. You matter more to me than... Whatever that is. You matter more to me than the differences we have over politics. You matter more to me than the differences we have over human sexuality. You matter more to me than the differences we have over climate change or over leadership in the church or whether you matter more to me than the fact that you like contemporary worship and I like traditional. Whatever it is, you matter more to me than that. Could we start behaving that way? Could we, could we look at each other here in this family and have this ethic that says, you matter more to me than the differences that we have? That's what I think Paul is teaching here. So, here once more. Stay united through affirming our essential beliefs and mission. So here's the takeaway from today relentlessly strive to remain united. It's the second week in a row I've used the word relentlessly. As I leave, I want to encourage you to relentlessly strive to remain united because I'm not a prophet. I've never claimed to have the gift of prophecy. But I do have this sense that the evil one is going to try to tear this congregation apart. That's not, that's not unique to us. I think it's happening in a lot of churches in our culture. We're reflective of what's happening in the wider culture. He's going to try to tear you apart. Relentlessly strive to stay united. For the sake of your faith, for the sake of your children's faith, and for the sake of your mission to the greater world. Relentlessly strive to stay united. Well, two of the final four are complete. Mission moves on. Easter Sunday, the finals. Whoa, which will move on to the last Sunday, grace or mission? We'll, let, we'll have to come and see. But next week, Pastor Mike's going to be preaching. Palm Sunday begins Holy Week. And he's got a wonderful sermon about what draws you to worship. In response to what we've heard today, let's be united in our faith. Let's stand and confess our essential beliefs using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.